Hey everybody, my name is Sharon Quinn and I'm also known as the original Runway Diva and you are watching Model Behavior. Class is officially in session. Today my guest lecturer is actor, singer, songwriter, and consummate stage performer, my friend, soul brother, number new, brother Carlton J. Smith is in the building. Welcome, Carlton, mm -hmm. to Model mm -hmm. Behavior. Mm -hmm. You God, your hands smell you know so good. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm you know sorry. what? Here we go. <laughs> All right. Yeah, just tell them how you got your start and your inspiration for doing the, the well, what was the pivotal moment? When the, you the pivotal you moment that, that led me to, to do what, I, what it is I do, which is sing and dance and perform and entertain, which is far more important than anything else. Um, 1968, my father passed away suddenly. And uh, a few months later, my mother took me to the Apollo Theater mm -hmm. to see James Brown. And it was my first time going anywhere like that. And uh, I remember black people coming to the theater looking just regal and majestic. So I knew something was going on then. The curtains opened, the orchestra standing there, stock still just ready, I mean, grim face, just ready to work. Uh, I didn't know that's what it was at the time, but I'm just like, whoa, these guys are serious. And James Bond comes out in a powder blue ruffle shirt, powder blue pants, black patent leather shoes, silver pirate buckle. Diamond ring sparkled up to the balcony where I was, and I remember thinking, this is the most amazing, and he hadn't done anything yet. <laughs> most amazing thing I've seen, I, this is what I want, uh, with your bad self. <laughs> Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. I'm like, I was gone. And uh, it was just amazing. Then of course, the whole please, 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 cape mm. routine. And I remember the first time he, he spun and hit his knees, they put the cape on him. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I hope he does that again. And he did it like four <laughs> or five more times. I love this guy. So that's what did it. Now you 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 got to play James Brown. First man to portray James Brown on the silver screen. I'm Chadwick. Right. <laughs> In Liberty Heights. God bless you. You did his and thing. You, uh, you were excellent. Thank and, you, you know, I know that Thank that's you. the role that you were born to play. And Thank you. Y'all should have gave that to Carlton. What's it's the, okay. We got some other stuff coming. We got some other stuff coming. Um, how did that feel to to work with, with a director that's as well known as, as Barry, Barry Levinson, Levinson was, was wonderful. It, it was, you know, the, the whole movie making experience wasn't, not to sound weird about it, it wasn't a big thing. It was just like, you just do another show. Just when you're prepared and you know what it is you have to do, then you just execute. The whole thing leading up to it was amazing because as I said, the first place my mother ever took me was to the Apollo Theater. Mm -hmm. Started a lifelong love affair with James Brown. September 9th, 1994, he was scheduled to play the Apollo. And at this point, I didn't really want to go see him because he was old and I didn't want to tarnish the memories. But my friend Kendall Brown, who mm -hmm. worked in the Apollo, said, yeah, you say that every time, but then you show up at the last minute. And it's true. I went, <laughs> oh, let me go see. And I said, no, something's going to happen tonight that'll keep me from coming. I'll get a date with Halle Berry, Beyonce will marry me. Something will happen tonight that'll keep me from <laughs> showing up. My mother passed away that oh. night. Devastated, okay? September 9th. So a couple of years later, I'm sitting, I'm, it's September 9th, and I'm praying, thinking about her. And the phone rings. Carlton, this is Harry Weinger from Universal Pictures. We heard about your performance because you portrayed James Bond in the movie. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. He said, no, we, we heard about it. We know, what, you know, could you do it? So sure enough, um, they said, look, we need a videotape of you lip syncing the songs. So if you could just have this to us by next Monday, then we can look at it and review it with all the other candidates. I said, I'll get it to you by Monday. We went to the studio, sort of like this one. I had a bow tie James Bond gave me, bought a wig. It was an Al Sharpton wig. That's what they called it, an Al Sharpton <laughs> wig. And, and a, a tuxedo, and I taped the whole show like James Brown. Every other day, they're calling me. We didn't get the tape yet. We didn't get the tape yet. I said, it'll be there Monday. Monday morning, got on the plane, flew to Los Angeles. As I pulled up to the building on Rodeo Drive, I'll never forget it, a white van pulls up next to my taxi <laughs> playing a James Brown song. I'm like, what are the odds? I got this. I go in the building. I go upstairs to see the lady. I go into her office. She says, you don't live here, you live in New York. What are you doing here? I said, I really want this movie role. Well, come on in. I come in, I sit down, I plop down the chair, knock over every CD in her wall unit, <laughs> except one. James it's Brown. James Brown CD. I said, I got this. <laughs> Life is stranger than, what is it, fiction, what's mm -hmm. it saying? So that was, a, that was the most amazing part of it. Doing the actual thing, it was just, that was a brief, it felt so good to have some hair again. They gave me a wig, Sharon. You, and I, yes, I understand. I was blowing the hair up and yes. it was just, I know. God, it's wonderful. You are so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
after you did uh, Liberty Heights, yeah, then you 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 went back to regular life for the most part. I was there yeah. for that. Yeah. Now, you as you've been you've been pretty much self managing. Yeah. Yourself. You know what happened after Liberty Heights? I wound up with a regular job for a minute, and you don't remember this. Every Friday night, I sang on the 107th floor of the World Trade Center. Yes, I do remember that. That's what I was doing every Friday night. The last Friday night, which was September 7th, you came to see me, and you wouldn't wait around to see me perform. And I'm like, Sharon, come on, I'm going to go on. No, Carlton, this something doesn't feel right. We are up too high. We ain't supposed to be this high. And you left. I remember thinking, no, that's... I can't say it. <laughs> I was annoyed with you. But God bless. We know what happened after that. And then from that point on, uh, we did Vegas. Yes. That's, yes. Where, that's where you changed your hairstyle. Yes. Uh, what else? And I lost a bunch of weight. But yes. what I, the point I'm trying to make is it takes dedication yeah. to, to, to do what you do and, and stick to it. Yeah. Even when things are not all that great. Yeah. And I remember those times when... Yeah. Things were just, it, for the amount of talent that you had, you could see that none of us were being paid our worth. But we should have, yeah. So how did you overcome all you gotta, of that? You got to step out on faith. You know what they say. Uh, but that's, uh, it's hard to step out on faith when the rent got to be paid. I know, but, but you just have to know that it's like, it's like we, put a, we put a letter in a mailbox and we don't think about all the possible channels that it has to go through to get to where it's going to go. We just assume it's going to get there. We hit that light switch. We just assume the light's going to go on. You just have to just know that it's going to happen. You know, uh, yes, yes, prayer works. Prayer is asking for rain. Faith is carrying an umbrella. You just have to believe it and just know it. And that sounds cliched. No, that it sounds, sounds easier. That's really profound. You have no, sometimes you have no choice. I knew I wasn't going to go back to work at some job like the one I was working at. That I knew I wasn't going to do. And I didn't have a daughter yet, so things weren't as drastic. I would do anything for my daughter now, Misa. So, you know, but at the time, things weren't as drastic. It's easy to do when it's just you. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, and I'm asking for the, the people who are the aspiring performers who are watching and really, really struggling. I mean, yeah. I'm not singing now because life, get inter singing again. life intervened and I couldn't, it wasn't supplementing my okay. household. Okay. So, and it, it's, it, it's even harder to do that in New York now with the way that the music industry oh, has changed right about that. and all that. So how does one, how did you get the gig that took you overseas into all these other <coughs> exotic uh, locales and... How did you negotiate your own business? Well, well, your own remember stuff? the shows you used to do down at the bottom line? Yes. And I would just go out of my way to entertain. Forget about all the wonderful riffs and singing and runs or whatever. What you, what you uh, uh, aspiring performers need to understand is people always want to be entertained. As long as you can entertain, you don't, you don't need a hit record, you don't need whatever. People are going to come to your show because they know they're going to have a good time. <laughs> so my thing is always, has always been to entertain as opposed to I must hit the perfect note. You know, uh, and I, I want to be a phenomenal singer, but I really want to make everybody go home happy. So we would do the shows at the bottom line. I would go out of my way to entertain. And they put me on other shows. And a club in China called looking around for a group to replace a jazz band that had, had, had canceled. And the guy recommended me. That was in 2004. I went over there to do one show and pretty much wound up living there for the past 10 years. I would come home, as you know, for mm -hmm. like a couple of weeks, but then I would go back. And I would come off stage in China, and somebody was always, we got a club in Russia, we got a club in Finland, we got a club in Norway, Switzerland. I've got to go, I've, I've had a chance to go places that I never thought I would go. Um, and, and of course, you make some mistakes initially and, and not ask them what you're worth till you see how much money they're making, how much they're generating. And, and, and the staff, see, I always befriend the staff, and mm -hmm. they tell you the real deal, this club has never been packed like this. You know what I'm saying? Ah. Yes, they've never made this really now. You know, so I remember the first, I remember the first gig in China. They were paying me four hundred dollars a week. Now I was just glad to be in China, glad to be away. You know, I'd never been to mm -hmm. China before, but um, no, no, I know better now. Every time I see them, I'm just like, hey, you know, you know, and I know you know. <laughs> I don't blame you. You got that first, but the next time, no, they had to pay, and they still got to pay. You know, like I won't go back now until we do certain things. You know, the the the, the shows and performances that you turn down are just important, as important as the ones you take. Because you turn them down, they know that they just can't just offer you anything. So Okay, now I want you to... to no, 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 don't be. I want to talk, before we even get close to running out of time, I want to talk about um, the promo video, The Lifetime of R&B. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, um, that's my... Uh. Tell me a little bit about it before I bring up the clip. We do have a clip, so I want you to tell the whole okay. thing, just real quick. A Lifetime of R&B. You stupid, clip. okay? Okay. 
<laughs> you know what, Carlton? Oh, well, you know what? They used to put up, well, I say it all in the, in the clip. There's nothing I'm going to say now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's take a look at the clip. Let's, shall yeah, we? Yeah, let's, let's, let's cue up the clip. A lifetime of R&B, guys. This is a hit! My name is Carlton J. Smith. I was born and raised in New York City, El Barrio, Spanish Harlem. When I was eight years old, my mother took me to the Apollo Theater to see James Brown. From that moment on, I was raised by my mother and music. Ladies and gentlemen, it's star time at the Apollo Theater. Back in the day, when a recording artist was coming to town to perform, promoters would put up posters in barbershops, pool rooms, and on street corners. And uh, it, it would advertise the venue, the ticket price, the date. I would always take one down and bring it home as sort of a memento. I still have them. to invite you all to come and see my show, A Lifetime of R&B. It's a one-man show starring yours truly, Carlton J. Smith. I'll have the actual posters on display. I'll be telling you stories and anecdotes about what went on backstage. I'll talk about the shows, the song. In fact, my band and I will also be playing the songs that you know by these artists. So it's going to be a fun trip, a musical trip down memory lane, a lifetime of R&B starring Carlton J. Smith. I'll see you soon at a theater near you. A lifetime of R&B. <laughs> Clip. It's going to be a fun show, I'm telling you. That, you know, I've, I've, I've been collecting memorabilia forever. Clipping just things, taking things out of magazines, keeping ticket stubs, just forever. And, and now that I have all this stuff, a good buddy of mine, Danny Brookins, wonderful guy, wonderful DJ, just recently became a father. God bless you, Danny. Uh, he would come to my house and talk about artists, and I'd look at this poster, look at this, look at this. And after about the fifth time, he said, I feel like I should be paying $10 every time I come in your house. You got to do something with this stuff because there is no place else in the world. It doesn't exist anymore. So that's what made me, uh, that's what gave me the idea to do this. So you're doing a, a tour, right? Well, well, that's what we want to do. But it may be a residency at first. We're not exactly sure how we're going to do it. Like they're talking about doing it in Turkey. But in, that's a New York show. It needs to happen here in New York. Absolutely. Those posters were Absolutely. hanging up town and lampposts oh, in yeah, New York. Oh, yeah, I remember those days. Yeah, yeah. So it needs to be here. And, um... We, we're going to try to incorporate a lot of other things. And I still have every ticket stuff from every concert I ever went to. Yes, I know. Every autograph. Now I've been getting the posters signed. I just left Stephanie Mills at BB Games. But now that, that you're looking back and you see that you've done, you, you, they had to, I mean, what was it that made you decide to, one, take down, well, I know what made you take down the posters, the same thing that made me take them down. Just loving music. Just, yeah, but you hung on to them. All of this, this, this time. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. Did you did you know that maybe you were sitting on a potential gold mine? Not at all. I just wanted to keep this stuff to go with the music. And when I look at the album and read all the names of the back of the album covers to go look at it and just reflect. I mean, I don't know. It's only as I'm looking at it right now and realizing realizing how much stuff I've amassed over the years. I'm like, wow. I must have ripped something out of a newspaper every day, out of a magazine, right on magazine, Jet magazine. And these things, you could put a frame around them and people would hang them in their offices, artwork. Right. So we're going to do major things with this stuff. I just have to find some people to work with and um, we're going to get it done. And that's not even touching on, we're just talking about ticket stubs and memorabilia. We're not even talking about the massive amount of music yeah. that you yeah. have. My you vinyl. Have, do you have I would never get rid of my vinyl. Never. Uh, my 45s, 8 tracks, 78s, all of that stuff. Um, a 78. Love, yeah, I got a couple. I got a couple. I got These a couple kids of don't even know what a 78, a 78 is. is. Oh my God. Okay. Or a 45 for that matter. Half yeah. of them have not even seen vinyl. You know what? I, I told my daughter Misa, I said, you will never understand the joy. Because, you know, now everything is a download. You never understand the joy of buying an album, reading the, uh, the liner notes, and seeing the stuff that was inside. I used to think when I would get an album, that the group recorded the entire album wearing what they had on on the cover. <laughs> I thought that's how it went. <laughs> they, so the first time I saw a picture of an artist in the studio wearing sneakers and jeans, I'm like, oh my God, you look like that and you sound like that. It's just one of those weird things <laughs> that you, you think you as a kid. You just brought up a good point. Now, as long as I've known you, me and you, it's always about 
how you look. Please, we got a get shot of a doubt. On yes. stage. Yes. And you know, today's artists, I, I see more underwear and sneakers and jeans. You know, we would never get on stage. You, would go to re you wouldn't go to rehearsal. No. Dress like that, you know what <laughs> I mean? You're supposed to look like a star at, at all, all times. times. At all Tell times. Tell them why that's important, particularly in, in today's music. Yeah, you know, well, we don't have enough time, but I will say this. I would go to the Apollo Theater and the, the curtains would open and the group would come flying out, the singer would come walking out and they always had something that was just like, oh my God, it was just amazing. You knew <clears throat> that was Marvin Gaye and you weren't. You knew that was <laughs> Donna Ross and you weren't. Nowadays, the whole familiarity breeds con contempt. It's just, it's ridiculous. You, you must look like a star. See, you I don't wanna pay a uh, hundred dollars, a hundred fifty dollars, and see you wearing the same stuff I got. Oh, on. I'm dressed better than you. Yeah, yeah. You know, you go see bands now. You go see major acts. Somebody got in a baseball cap or jeans or sneakers. It's just like, no, you can't. You can't look like that. That James Brown would find his band if their shoes weren't shine. When you see him sliding past the horn section, makes sense when he's looking at our shoes. He's looking at our clothes to see who's right. You have to look as the audience pays money for that button that's missing off your jacket. Mm -hmm. You want to look like a star at all times. After each show. James Brown would go into the dressing room, get his hair done again, put on a different suit, get in the limo to go right to the hotel. He says, but you never know who's going to see me. I got to look right at all times. One of the last shows I saw of his, um, he was 72. They announced him, blah, 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 James Brown. And Sharon, just before he got to the stage, I remember he stopped and went and walked on stage. I remember thinking, you still care? Just gave himself a little, okay, I'm right and went on the stage, and that, that just blew me away. That, my respect for him shot up just that much more. You still care after all the stages you've walked on, so I still care all the stages I walk on, and the bands I, I'm in front of, except for my guys in China, Luke Kessel, Lawrence Perry, Mike Null, Eric Smith, those guys, they, I make sure they dress well and they do it, but all these other bands, they look like derelicts. Yeah, I, I remember that was a sticking point Please. for you when we were doing all those B.B. King shows. Please. Particularly with the band, and I, 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 I get it, because yeah. you, you done up to the nines. I'm wearing silk and suits, you got on jeans? You, you got the gym teachers behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really, look. and then you look at the pictures or you look at the video footage and you're, you're, you're It you're, takes you're, away from yeah, it. Yeah, your focus is taken away because you're like, well you sound good, but what the hell are they wearing? Is he, exactly. Let me say something, God, Turkey, I love you, but all the bands in Turkey, all the musicians I see, they dress like absolute, I've seen people in soup kitchens dress better than them, they, they look horrible. <laughs> The stuff they wear, it's just like, my man, you're going to put that on, you're wearing that on stage? Even when you're dressed well, you never get to the venue wearing what you're going to wear on stage. You change. You don't even let the people see you before you get on stage. It's about, and I, I don't know, maybe I'm a relic from a bygone era, but I will stand by that era. And I'm doing a book called Soul Fashion. Well, see, I don't, ooh, that's a good title. You, you know how we used to dress? Yes. And you look at these outfits and we see back the, to back. You go see the Supremes, and then you go home trying to duplicate that look. Well, I didn't. I was more Not the Supremes. Yes, I, 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 yeah. I get it. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'd be a little moist if I was it. <laughs> sorry. You know what, Carlton? <laughs> okay. See, I, no, I, I can't be trying to put <laughs> I never wanted to be a Supreme. Shut up. Okay. Let's talk about gum. Grown up music. Yeah. This is your most recent C D? Yeah. Did you bring a copy? No, I didn't. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Let's talk about that. <laughs> what, what we need some grown up music. I mean, I you know, again, I don't mean to make it sound like I'm a million years old, but when you Remember we did the Motown show? Oh, absolutely. Okay, we did Mo a, a salute to Motown. Everybody just salutes everybody now, but without really adhering to what the what the the, the, the craft was, the music was about. But we had to learn all those lyrics, and when you really read those lyrics, it's like, oh my God. The way what these people wrote, what they felt, how they how they expressed it, and the way the singers would emote as well. And they was they wasn't cursing. Not at all. I just I don't understand where music has gone. Let me tell you, but you know something that's deep. My girl Anna says uh, she likes Muhammad Ali, and every time we watch something of his, she says, and he never, never cursed. cursed. It's unbelievable. I just read something with Rakim, one of the greatest rappers ever. He says I never, never cursed. cursed. Like unbelievable. I mean, you got to respect that. Uh, Drake. <laughs> okay. But uh, there's a couple of songs that are okay, but that song Marvin's Room, the music, the arrangement is beautiful. I've and never those heard lyrics. That. I gotta go look at Oh, that you've up. heard it. Uh huh. Yeah, you've heard it. Uh, and the, the, it's just that these, these aren't lyrics. You, we shouldn't write stuff like this. F that N word that, you, that you're messing with. I'm walking down the street in Istanbul. Let me show you what hip hop has done. Not to blame it all on hip hop, but the hip hop, you must shoulder a great part of the blame. I'm walking down the street in Istanbul, Turkey. Three young girls walk by me. As they walk by me, one of them goes, nigga. <gasps> and I, as I turned to her to say, Susan, did you trust? She went, nigga. Oh my nigger! God. 
She, I have it on my phone because I made her do it again. She was so thrilled because I, I met a nigga. And then she went me, yes, West Side. She, she, I thought she had all She was trying to make the. I will show you on my phone. I couldn't even be mad at her because you could see she knew no better. Now, at the gym, I work out over there. They play hip-hop all the time. And I don't listen to hip-hop that much, not 24-7. But when I'm there for a couple of hours, and I'm, I'm stunned at how much we use the word. Can I say the B word? Might as well. Okay. Uh, how much the, the word niggers, the words nigger and bitch are in every lyric, in every song. And as I'm in there working out, I get self-conscious because I'm like, I what these people think of me. Because they know that's my music, my culture, from mm -hmm. my country. And to hear us disrespecting ourselves like that. You know, so I've had this happen a couple of times. One time a guy, we had a show, everybody's going berserk. And this one comes to me after the show, goes, oh, in this broken English, oh, you're so, when I come back, I want to be born a nigga. I'm, I'm, my man, okay. okay. <laughs> All right, you want to take a picture? Yeah, okay. They don't, they don't know. And it's because they hear us say it all the time in our music. You know, we've got, and we could do a whole show on that because it's something that's very close to my heart. And all these white artists singing R&B and making all this money, they ain't cursing. They ain't saying the N-word. Was we running after the same little, you know, crabs in a barrel type situation and, and just, just embarrassing ourselves. See, I, I, I remember when you couldn't say damn, you couldn't say hell. All of that would be poop. Well, you'd skip over it. You told me a teacher made you take off that record. Sexy, 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 sexy. sexy, sexy. sexy. We'll yes. be playing that in our classroom. <laughs> and that's all you said. She's sexy, sexy, sexy. <laughs> take that off, damn it. Okay. Yeah. But now, what, where, <clears throat> at what point did it become okay for us to do this? I hate to, to say this? it, but hip hop. I love hip hop. I have my favorite hip hop artists that I live and die by. But hip hop, you must shoulder some of the blame. Richard Pryor let the N word out the bag. And then all the parents that would listen to those Richard Pryor albums, their kids became the Def Jam comedians, and that took it to the next level. Hip hop also changed the way artists dress on stage. R&B singers wearing jeans and sneakers, they never did that before. But everybody wanted to be comfortable, and we've gotten too familiar. We've just gotten too familiar, and we disrespect our culture all the time. That's just how I feel that about did it. That. Yeah. Is a whole nother, whole nother sh show. show and whole new God conversation. Bless. God bless. Now you you also working on a, a a book, a lifetime of life. Yeah. Growing up in Spanish Harlem. Yeah. Let's talk about that. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I had three sisters. It's hell. <laughs> I'm still hurt. Okay. <laughs> but you know, <coughs> I, you know, unlike a lot of the cliched books that you see, certain black authors, I've never been in jail. Never been on drugs. Never, not as in my life, there's always been a whole bunch of funny, stupid things that happen as I tell people, oh, you got to write a book. So I just put down all these funny incidents, these, these things that just happened all the time. And it's just, it's just fun. It's a, yeah, I can't wait to read that one. Uh -huh. It's just fun. There's a suit hanging on the back of my door right now. I got suspended from school. I got suspended from every school. I said, but just being mischievous. So the first day is great. You know, it's wonderful. I'm free. But the second day, you're bored because all your friends are in school. So I'm just wandering around. <laughs> New York City aimlessly. I find I discovered a store where James Bond apparently bought clothes. So I was hanging out there like every smelling the, did he wear this? You know, <laughs> smelling the clothes. <laughs> Kid, get out of here. He's not in. He's not coming in here. Because they had Polaroids in the window. But this was every day having a ball, just going there. Friday, 2.30. 30 minutes left. My mother goes to school to pick me up because she knew that I wanted to buy a particular suit. She got some money. She wanted to surprise me. And she you went were to school. Suspended? And she said, later on, she said, what made her feel so bad was that this white lady grabbed her by her hand and said, Miss Smith, don't you know? Carlton's been suspended all week. She said she never felt dumber. So she waited for me to get home. I came in. How was school today? Wonderful mother, educational. Which <laughs> was every day. Open the door to my room, and I thought we'd been robbed. <laughs> my record player was gone. My records were gone. All my posters were torn down off the wall. I'm like, what is happening? And I felt a chill behind me. And I said, mother, don't you ever embarrass me like that again. Now, I should kill you, but I'm going to take all your records. That's going to hurt you more. And I'm like, mom, please don't take my records. Okay, cut off an arm or something. Don't take my records. <laughs> Can I have just one record, please? <laughs> please, just one. And I'm trying. So I thought she'd give me Best of Temptations, Best of Al Green, whatever. She brought back Peter, Paul, and Mary. They gave me that. So th to this day, I can't stand here puffed the Magic Dragon. <laughs> um, here. Okay, you can listen to that one. Now, get dressed because we're going to go buy the suit that I came to get. And she still took me and bought me the suit. And it is hanging on the back of my door right now. Two years later, James was at the Beacon Theater. I'm wearing his suit. They bring me to the dressing room. He comes out from under the dryer. That's a nice suit. You mighty clean there, brother. Come sit down next to me. And I sat there, man. Then two of the Ozzy brothers came and sat on the other side of him. I'm just like, 
I think I may have soiled my underwear. I don't know. But I'm like, oh, shit. Okay? But, yeah, I mean, just a bunch of things like that. Just crazy things or whatever. So, um, and all music related, pretty now much. Now, you said that um, you're doing six shows. When I perform in China, six, six shows. Days, six, six days a week, three shows a night. I love it. But that's got to be, is, is that taxing on your voice? Yes, it is. It, it can be. But then again, early on in China, I made all the mistakes everybody makes. But now, I go to the gym every day. What get mistakes are those? Running around, staying up late at night, eating all kind of crazy food, talking a lot and hanging out. All the things that you shouldn't do if you're going to be singing every night. You have to protect your voice. Mm -hmm. So I, I have all my fun on stage. Other than that, I'm pretty boring off stage. So I would just relax and take it easy because I, I love that. The, the, in Turkey, I make a lot more money. But I, I'm not performing as much. I would do like maybe two shows a week. Whereas in China, it's it's six. I love that. So um. So you just live to be on stage entertaining. That's, I love it. That's your thing. I love it. I love. I really enjoy. It. I love just being on the stage, even talking to people. I just get a big kick out of it. You um. What's your what's your plans for the the future? What's what you a lifetime got? of R and B. Besides that, and and uh, another project we have called Hello Music, which is just all this memorabilia, all this music, all this stuff. I just, want to, I just want to try to help restore black music to its former glory and let it get the respect that we deserve and we so richly deserve. Yeah, other cultures know their heroes, know their, know their legends. And they, we don't. Black people in town, some of them don't know Johnny Taylor from Elizabeth Taylor. It's ridiculous. And we need to know these people. We need to know the names of the temptations. But how do we get back to that? I mean, it can, I mean it's wonderful that you're doing it, but it can't just be you. Well, I'm sure that there's some other people out there like me, and I just hope that everybody makes a concerted effort. Oh, yes, you know, everybody wants to say that hip-hop helps because it makes people go uh, look for the sources of the samples, and it does. Half the time, they don't even look, though. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's the that's other the problem. problem. But we also need to respect our culture as well. We need to, when, these, when these groups come to perform, we need to go see them. We need to go support them. And when, they, to, when they, maybe that album isn't a big hit, we need to still support them. This is the biggest problem that you're I right have. You're right and about I, we, that. You're right about that. And we're almost out of time, so I can't get into it. But when, you know, they, our people are quick to say, oh, they over with. We, you know, we, we yeah. ain't feeling them no yeah. more. Yeah, yeah. But they can, White folks pay a million dollars to go see the Rolling Stones. Come on, they're 80 years old. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. All right, Sorry, Mick. <laughs> <laughs> she said it. Not me, Mick. <laughs> we are almost out of time. I'd like to thank my guest brother Carlton J. Smith for coming down and sharing his knowledge with us today. Nobody can see you kissing my hand. Before I go, I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts. Remember that you can't change the game until you first learn the game. Amen. Always surround yourself with positive people and positive things and do what you love and love what you do. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. Thanks for watching Model Behavior, and I'll see you guys next week. Class is officially dismissed. <laughs> Bye, y'all. <laughs>